A very good afternoon to all, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. Today is the 14th, eh? January 2024. So we will be continuing our sharing from this book, The Heart Sutta. We are at page 7. Eh? So as usual, we will compose our mind, develop our sadha, virya, then mindfully we shall Proceed with the Puja Chanting. Namo Ben Su Su Jia Moni Fo. Namo Ben Su Su Jia Moni Fo. Namo Ben Su Su Jia Moni Fo. Namo Kuan Sing Pusa. Namo Kuan Sing Pusa. Namo Kuan Sing Pusa. Namo Ami Tofo. Namo Ami Tofo. Namo Ami Tofo. Namo Mila Fo, Namo Mila Fo, Namo Mila Fo, Namo Pusian Pusa, Namo Pusian Pusa, Namo Pusian Pusa, Namo Tisang Wang Pusa, Namo Tisang Wang Pusa, Namo Tisang Wang Pusa, Namo Fo Pusa, Namo Fo Pusa, Namo Fo Pusa. Arahang Sama Sam Buddha Bhagawa Buddha Bhagawanta Abhiwa Demi Suaka To Bhagawa Ta Dhamma Dhamma Namasami Supati Pano Bhagavato Sao Kasango Sanghang Namami Namo Atasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Atasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Atasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddhang Saranang Gachami Dhammang Saranang Gachami Sanghang Saranang Gachami Dutiampi Bhattang Saranang Gachami Dutiampi Dhammang Saranang Gachami Dutiampi Sanghang Saranang Gachami Dutiampi Bhattang Saranang Gachami Dutiampi Dhammang Saranang Gachami Tatiampi Sanghang Saranang Gachami Panati Pata Viramani Sikha Padang Samadhi Yami Adina Dana Viramani Sikha Padang Samadhi Yami Kami Sumicha Chara Viramani Sikha Padang Samadhi Yami Sura Miraya Maja Pamadatana Viramani Sikha Padang Samadhi Yami Sadhu 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 Okay, let's pay respect to Pajam. Bedang Pujimi Lemang Pujimi Sanghang Pujimi We shall continue with our second lesson of our Heart Sutta Dhamma Sharing We are at page 7 but before we continue with our part 2, which is on the meditation and the important essential dhamma that we discussed in that first lesson, we would like to actually uh, 
go through uh, the whole of this Heart Sutta again. This is our, uh, I think, for the long review session. Uh, uh, this is the second time we are going through it. Uh, so for those who intend uh, to develop a strong foundation of the Buddhist teaching, especially the Theravada tradition, if you want to form a strong base uh, and develop good understanding of the Buddhist teaching, which is the teaching as taught by Sakyamuni Buddha. Uh, so this long version of the sharing of this Han Sutta book is very important, very useful, especially for those who intend to attend the retreat at the end of the year. Uh, this year is tentatively we plan it for August, uh, August 2024. So you can have a strong basic foundation of this Buddhist teaching or the Buddha Dharma as taught by Sakyamuni Buddha in the Theravada tradition, then it will help you a lot. You will save a lot of time, develop a lot of understanding and progress along the path of Dharma very swiftly. Because during the retreat, we only have about usually eight to nine days to complete the sharing of this book, the Heart Sutta. So if you don't have a stable foundation, it may not be easy for you all to develop the ability to comprehend or understand what we teach at the retreat. Basically, the original sharing took us 15 months, like we gone through in our first lesson of the Heart Sutta. Then after that, we go to the Heart Sutta itself. Then from there, we went into the first and second aspect of the five aggregate of form and mind. This understanding of the five aggregate of form and mind are very important because in the final summary of the first number two, the Buddha mentioned very clearly he said, in short, it is due to living beings, sakharity or delusion, that condition them to grasp onto this fine aggregate of form and mind that he called dukkha or suffering. So if that is the case, we need to inquire, what are these five aggregates of form and mind? That's why when I teach, I come up with the two aspects. So these two aspects are very important. Once you know the two aspects, then you can put it to test. Whether what the Buddha said is true or not. Whether when you grasp and cling onto this fine aggregate of form and mind, or for our case is the human being, whether there is suffering or not. Uh, so that part we have covered. So now we are coming to the second part. So you continue with the sharing. So under the second part is in fact there is a session for meditation about 45 minutes. Then after that we share the essential Dhamma of the Buddha. So under the sharing of the essential Dhamma of the Buddha, the first two most important essential dharma are the five mental hindrances and the five spiritual faculties. So under the teaching, the Buddha at that time, he need to explain to the cultivator of the way, what are the mind states that can hinder your mind? from entering the meditative state of inner peace, 
inner calmness and inner awareness. And he called them the Panjaniya Nivaranas. This is the Pali words. Pancha means Pai. Nivarana means mental hindrance. So these five mental hindrance, as stated in the teaching, are sensual desire, ill will, sloth and torpor, or what we call sleepiness, lethargic mind. Then the fourth hindrance is restlessness of mind. And finally is doubt. When you have these five mental states, they constitute mental hindrance because they will hinder your mind from entering the meditative state of inner peace and inner calmness. Take for example, sensual desire. Means as a human being, we have our five physical senses. We have the eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, tactile, and finally the brain. So these six sense bases, they can give rise to six types of consciousness. And all this can trigger off sensual emotion. So upon contact of our mind with the sense bases, and together with the respective sense data, it will trigger off the respective sense of consciousness. So this triggering off is like the physics experiment that I explained before, yeah? where we have a light bulb, a battery, and a switch. Then when everything is functioning in order, you own the switch, the light bulb lights up. So the light bulb is like the sense organ, analogy, sense organ. Then the switch is to make contact. Yeah? Then the battery is the power source that give energy to the circuit. Then the lighting up is the equivalent of us becoming conscious. That's why upon contact, consciousness arises. So we can give rise to seeing consciousness. Means we can become conscious of what we see through the eye organ. Then conscious of what we hear through the hearing ear organ. Then conscious of smell through our nose, tongue, taste, taste through our tongue. Then tactile through our physical body surfaces, then mental consciousness to our brain. We are basically our brain is an organ by itself. It has all the memories. So whatever you accumulate as memories, <coughs> they are all of your views, opinion, conditioning, knowledge, and even life experiences, good and bad. So all these are memories. Some are psychological memories. Some are mechanical memories. <coughs> some are knowledge. Some are facts and all these things. So whatever you accumulate in your memory, they can actually trigger of thinking, thought process. Because basically when you are mindful, when you are aware, you can actually come to understand how you create thought. Basically thought is respond to memory. Without memory, there is no thought. That's why the newborn baby, before they have any uh, accumulated memory in their brain, they are very cute, very sincere, very naive, that there, there is no memory. That's why they cannot create thought. So they have to learn through your conditioning, 
through your so-called uh, guided DG counseling or whatever and uh, whoever that actually bring them up so they use their senses to observe and learn then later on thought become like normal to them so that's how as a living being for our case as a human being we develop this brain through conditioning since birth until now then it become like a bundle of memories with its views opinion conditioning and belief system and through the senses we operate that's how we come to become what we are that's how we function as a human being and to function as a human being we need to know the world we need to interact with the world so the way we know the world is through our senses without the senses you are like dead they are not aligned there is no line then without the senses you cannot interact with the world, with society, with humanity, with everything that you relate to through your senses. So these are important basic understanding. So the Buddha said, when you arise this sense door consciousness, you will develop feeling upon contact. But the moment you have feeling because of your views, opinion, conditioning, and belief system, you tend to stir your mind. The stirring of the mind or the reaction to sense experience is very important. If you don't have mindfulness, you cannot see all this movement. You cannot understand how you become what you are how through all your delusion, sakadity, your habitual tendency, you stir and react to sense experience. So when you stir, you will arise emotion, positive and negative. So the Buddha called this sensual desire and evil. Then why did he said they are mental hindrance. But the moment you arise, either sensual desire or ill will, your mind is not at peace. There is no equanimity. You have sensual desire or you want to push it away with ill will, envy, jealousy, negative emotion. These two mental hindrance, they are very common and they result from the two evil roots of greed and hatred. When there is sensual desire, there is positive craving. Then when you have positive craving, you cannot be aware inside. That's how it distracts you. It hinders your mind from entering the meditative state of inner peace, inner calmness, and inner awareness. Likewise, when you see something, hear something, smell something, taste something, or tactically feel something, or think of something that you don't like, then there is this evil, aversion, dislike, or unpleasant feeling. This is negative craving. You want to push it away. You don't like that feeling. But that is security. But these are emotions that your mundane mind create and stir through your lack of understanding. So when that thing happens, whether it's positive craving or negative craving, like sensual desire, you will, it's a mental hindrance. Where you are lost in thought already. That craving positive or negative, they will actually de draw you away or distract you and prevent you from being aware within mindful. Awareness is the meditative mind. Craving 
is the mundane mind with the emotion. And in this case, they are mental hindrance. That's why they will hinder your mind from entering the meditative state or inner peace, inner calmness, and inner awareness. So this understanding is very important. Then the third one is love and torpor. Means for no reason when you want to meditate, your mind becomes sleepy, lethargic, and you fall into a state of sloth and like want to topple off. So this sleepiness cannot make you awake. That's why it cannot make you mindful or aware. Which means you doze off, you become unconscious or subconscious. Means you are not with your true mind in pure awareness. That's why this mind state is also a mental hindrance. It hinders your mind from becoming attentive, alert, aware, mindful. That's why it's called mental hindrance. Then the fourth one, restlessness of mind, is also very common. When living beings or human beings has problems, especially after they break their precept, uh, after they have killed people, harmed people, stolen things, tell lies, deceive, mismanage, or tell lies, take advantage of situation, then sometimes they commit what they call sexual misconduct. Or sometimes in our modern society, they go against the common law or society's law. They commit CBT, they rob, they kidnap, they commit a lot of what they call unethical things, uh, involving police case, like drugs, weapon, and many other things. So when all this arise, the human being, they will have problem. Then they worry. That's why restless of mind come from worry, anxiety, fear. When you worry about those things that you have done, which is unethical against the law, so the police can come after you. The anti-corruption can come after you, and many other uh, people can come after you, especially those who actually remember how you cheat them, how you actually deceive them, manipulate them, take advantage of them. Then your enemy, our anger, our hatred, they will come after you. That's why you keep on fearing, worry. Then you try to do something. That's how your mind becomes restless. Yeah. In fact, under the teaching, the Buddha did mention restlessness of mind can happen when you have to confront the first noble truth reality. The first noble truth reality as taught by the Buddha which I will go through afterwards, yeah? because I have to cover the Four Noble Truth yeah? before we go into all this teaching further. But before I cover the Four Noble Truth, I have to come to this five mental hindrance first. So under the First Noble Truth, the Buddha proclaimed there are eight conditions or realities of life and existence that living beings have to confront if you live life long enough. And when you confront them without the understanding of the Buddha's teaching, suffering will be the result. That's how powerful the teaching is. So the first four, the Buddha said, is birth, old age, sickness, and death. Normal human being may not see the danger of these four realities. 
but for those who have gone through life, live life long enough, you will start to understand the danger of birth, old age, sickness, and death. So most people will worry about their body becoming old, becoming sick, or receive injury and pending death. Especially nowadays with a traumatic disease or those things. So whenever you go through aging, when your senses are failing you, when you become like very weak, no longer in your youth, your senses are all starting to deteriorate and failing you, and you cannot have the normal type of youthful life anymore. So that one creates suffering in a living being. So how do they suffer? They have fear, they have worry, they have anxiety, they become sorrowful. They attach and cling to many things. This is how it happens. Then after that, the fifth reality is separation. Separation can happen in many ways. Through death, through calamity, through riots, war, or nature's disaster. Then there is another one, not due to death, due to economic crisis. All your possession, things that you cling on to, hold on to, can be your loved ones too. Yeah. When there is an economic crisis or major calamity, then there can be separation. Means you make one wrong call, decision, it can be your investment or involving your possession. You can lose them all. Yeah. Then the other one is separation due to relationship failure, especially married people. When there is pending misunderstanding leading to divorce and all the other related uh, anger, hatred, envy, jealousy, leading to separation, or what we call divorce in our modern society. Then even for younger people who may not be married, but relationship failure can also lead to envy, jealousy, or what they call uh, emotional, negative emotion that can be very, very traumatic and severe. So being jilted is one of the possibilities. Uh, then the other reality is when you are with people whom you don't like, the Buddha said. You also will not be happy. You also will be fearful of them, especially when you confront those abusive people, violent people. They can be your stepmother or bully or whatever. Aggressive, violent people. Then the other one is when things don't go your way, when your expectations in life are not met, when you cannot get what you want in life, you become unhappy, miserable. Then you start to worry. Especially those who go through disease, sickness, and all those things. So all this can lead to restlessness of mind. That's why it's a hindrance. When you have all these problems, it will hinder your mind from entering the meditative state of inner peace, inner calmness, and inner mindfulness. That's why mindfulness is very important, awareness is very important. These are mind states that are not related to the thinking. They are just a state of attentiveness, awareness, mindfulness. Then the last one is doubt. When you don't have the Understanding of the teaching means you don't have faith in the Buddha and his teaching. Then you start to doubt. 
Am I doing it correctly? Is this the right decision? Yeah. How am I going to continue with my life if all these things doesn't turn around? So all this create mental hindrance because when there is doubt, you cannot have faith. It can only be either or. So when there is no faith, the mental faculty is very weak. Restlessness coupled with doubt is the worst. Uh, then it will bring about tremendous emotion fluctuation within your own feelings. So when this happens, it will develop what we call depressive thought process, suicidal thought, depressive thought, cocoon of fearful thought. Fearful thought is the one that actually triggers depression. Yeah. Fear of death, fear of losing your loved one, yeah. fear of not getting what you want. There are so much things in life that can trigger intense fear. Even fear of losing your job, fear of reputation being affected, yeah. then fear of war, calamity, and all those things. So these are the reality. That's why the mental hindrance, when you understand, they are very real. So the Buddha's teaching is very simple, is it? These five mental hindrances are very common in humanity. Before you know the teaching, before you develop the understanding of the Buddhist teaching. So in the teaching, the Buddha said, in order to overcome these five mental hindrances, you need to cultivate the opposite five spiritual faculty, which is under part 2.1. The opposite five spiritual faculty of Sada, Virya, Sati, Samadhi, and Panya. These are Pali words. The equivalent English words are in bracket. Sada means faith in the Buddha and his teaching. Virya means spiritual zeal or tenacity to go this way. Sati means mindfulness or awareness. Then Samadhi means collectedness of mind or unwavering mind. And Panya is wisdom. Once you have this five spiritual faculty, then like the word spiritual faculty, it can allow you to understand spiritual teachings to overcome the mental hindrance. Now I will start to share with you. Once you have Sada, what happened when you have faith in the Buddha and his teaching? Your doubt no more. Your restlessness of mind also no more. Because without faith, you become restless, you have doubt. So the last two mental hindrances is gone. Then when you see the importance of this teaching, the Buddha's teaching, and how wise and virtuous the Buddha is. Means your faith in him becomes unshakable. Yeah, you can say during the time when the Buddha was born, 2,600 years ago, he is the wisest and the most virtuous living being ever to be born. And to have him as your guide and your teacher, you will have a lot of faith in him. Yeah. You not only have faith, you will have a lot of gratitude towards him. Then when you know his teaching is so amazing, exceptional, so beautiful, can bring about enlightenment in the here and the now and free you from all suffering, you will go all out to cultivate it. So this virya, the second spiritual faculty, is spiritual zeal spiritual tenacity to go this way after knowing who the Buddha is and how wonderful his teaching is, how special being he is. 
This is how with the virya, your sloth and torpor also no more. You cannot afford to be sleepy or lethargic anymore. You will become very diligent. It will spur you on. That's why the spiritual faculty of faith will lead to virya. Then when you have virya, it will drive you to cultivate. What do you cultivate? Sati, mindfulness. Your mindfulness is a meditative mind state. When you are mindful, you are aware. You are not lost in thought. You are not entangled by the mental hindrance. To be in the state of mindfulness or awareness, you have to be in the state of peace, tranquility and stillness without thought without any stirring of the mind, movement of thought process, without some creativity. So this understanding is very important. So when there is a deed, you cannot have sensual desire or you. When you are not mindful, then craving arise. When craving arise, mental hindrance arise, positive and negative craving. That's how it helps you to overcome sensual desire and ill will. Yeah. Then the fourth spiritual faculty is Samadhi. Your mind not only ever mindful, it becomes stable, collected, unwavering. So when you have that mind state of Samadhi, your mind can never be restless anymore. It is collected, unwavering. There is Samadhi. Then it will not stir at the moment of sense experience, which means it cannot trigger off sensual desire and ill will. It will make you peaceful, enable you to see things as they are. Then if you have the stability of mindfulness and samadhi, it can awaken you. You can insight into phenomena or see things as they are and develop the wisdom to awaken. Okay. Then you can also insight into the three universal characteristics of anichang, tukang, anatta, means impermanent, suffering state, and empty nature or non-self nature. Then finally, of course, the spiritual faculty of panya, which is wisdom. So with panya, definitely all the five mental hindrances will be gone. Once there is wisdom, the spiritual faculty are all in place. Unless you have the spiritual faculty in place, wisdom cannot arise. Your wisdom requires all the other four spiritual faculty. You need to have faith, virya, then cultivate sati, leading to samadhi. When there is sati and samadhi, there is the meditative mind. Then you can actually trigger off the meditative wisdom or understanding to awaken. You can see things as they are, insight into phenomena, and realize the wisdom or universal characteristics of nature, the three marks of existence. All this will arise. So these two pair, they are very important. Okay. So now I can go into the essence of the Buddha's teaching. Under this Buddhist teaching, the most important understanding is the essence of the Buddha's teaching. He called this the Four Noble Truth. Okay? So now I will write on the whiteboard so that you can start to have a revision of the Four Noble Truth to enable you to understand the teaching more deeply. So this Four Noble Truth, they are the essence of the Buddha's teaching. Why are they called Four Noble Truth? They are called no, Noble Truth because according to the Buddha, these are truth that can lead to enlightenment in the here and now. So when you have this Four Noble Truth cultivated or awakened to, it will result in transforming the individual into a noble one. 
Noble one at the time of the Buddha are called enlightened beings. So noble here means the Pali word equivalent is Arya. And Aryas are enlightened beings at the time of the Buddha because they have the embodiments of all the noble qualities of an enlightened being. That's why they have the embodiment of the Noble Eightfold Path. Yeah? They are very noble in every aspect of their life. They have right understanding or right view with regards to all the spiritual laws that governs life and existence. Then they also are very noble in the way they conduct themselves. Means they have right thought, right speech, and right action. Means they conduct themselves beautifully. They have noble qualities. That's why they will have the embodiments of this noble eightfold path. Yeah. Means the way they communicate with action and speech and the way they think, they are very noble in all aspects based on their wisdom and understanding. So now I will come back to the Four Noble Truths. This Four Noble Truths, according to the Buddha, they are like the secret of life. Because all of life, whether it's mundane or supramundane, can be explained by this Four Noble Truths. In fact, this Four Noble Truths is the summary of all of life understanding, covering both mundane and supramundane. So this is the beauty of this teaching. So when a being that has this capability to actually summarize all of his enlightenment understanding into just four number two, he must be the real one. Otherwise, he can't. So, I will now go into the four noble truth. The first noble truth. So, the Buddha called this the noble truth of Dukkha. In our common language, we call it suffering. So, like what I explained just now, the Buddha just proclaimed this truth. And this truth, according to the Buddha, there are eight realities of life and existence. So, basically, this one is explaining to us the eight realities of life and existence. Whatever you do in life, in existence, they can never be apart from these eight realities. It covers everything. So this part covers all of our mundane existence and activity. Whatever you do. Yeah. Then after he proclaimed this noble truth, he continued the second noble truth. So the second noble truth, the Buddha explained the cause of arising of this dukkha. And he said it is even to your craving. So there are three types of craving. Eh? Sensual craving, craving to be, and craving not to be. In Pali, it's called Kama Tangha, Bawa Tangha, and Vibhava Tangha. Okay? So, craving, here there are three types, which I have already uh, stated. <laughs> so, if you understand what suffering is and the cause behind its arising based on the first and second noble truth, then as a cultivator of the way, we will know how to actually manage our life better, isn't it? When you know that these eight realities that we have gone through, birth, old age, sickness, and death, separation, when you are with people whom you don't like, when things don't go your way, when you cannot get what you want, and finally is, in short, the final summary, due to your craving, conditioned by sakayadity or self-delusion that caused the arising of all this suffering. 
So when you know craving is the cause, we have to understand how craving operates. That's why we have to look at Kama Tangha, sensual craving, then craving to become and craving not to become. And these three things are very common in life. So, sensual craving, like I explained earlier on, you have your positive and negative. That craving to be when you want to become something, somebody, maybe promoted to your job or whatever. So this type of craving for politician is of course climb the political ladder for career or corporate uh, situation. It is to climb the corporate ladder. Uh, or the career path and other things. So, when there is craving to be, you strive very hard, and some do it through unscrupulous way. Then you violate the nature's law, then there will be consequence uh, that leads to suffering and misery. Uh, even in the arena of sports or whatever, there can only be per championship, huh? maybe one champion, then another one run up, or join champion, sometimes it can happen. But very rare. Most of them, they end up, they are not among the top. So, cause of arising of suffering is always craving. Craving to become. Then when you are up on that post, you realize it's a hot seat where everybody is fighting for. Then there are a lot of uh, people who want you down. So they backstab you. They actually try to scheme and plan to bring you down. They call it politics. Uh, office politics social politics or whatever. So when that thing happened, you find it so tough, the seat so hot, you try to give up. You say craving not to be you don't want to become that one. Then some is suicidal thought. Your life becomes so difficult, so tough. That's why this suicidal thought will arise. When suicidal thought arise, that is craving not to be. That's why you want to end your life. So all these are in the teaching. And these are the realities of life and existence. So when we understand is craving, then we have to look at craving. Why must you crave? So that brings us to the question of is ambition, to be ambitious, a craving? Actually, ambition is not really a craving. Ambition means you develop the ambition, then you work towards it. You know there is a way to lead to the ambition. Means you have to follow the rules, the rule of law, or whatever society's law. So when you have ambition, it's not a craving. Means it's like virya. You work towards it. Spiritual zeal. You work towards the spiritual cultivation. But for ambition is more of mundane. You work towards the career or the ambition you want to achieve to be a lawyer, to be a doctor, to be an engineer, or to be an accountant, or to be an IT professional, or to be a CEO or whatever. So all this can be understood and worked upon. As long as there is no craving or desire by not following the rules. Yeah. So that craving sometimes can drive people crazy, can bring about what they call mistake in life. So sensual craving and ill will, these two are called karma tangha, or basically it's just sensual craving can be positive and negative. Then craving to be and not to be. So all this is if you can work your way up and get promoted 
following the hierarchy or what they call rule of law, then it is your reward. Then there is not a craving. Means you work hard towards it. You have a what they call aim uh, or sincere uh, understanding of what this can be done, how this can be done. And because of that, you don't need to have craving. Uh, so, first and second noble truth. They relate to the reality of life and existence. They relate to suffering and the cause of arising of suffering. So when you understand the first and second noble truth, these are mundane aspects of life. Then you can manage your life better. When you know this is suffering and the cause is craving, you can manage it better. Then the teaching doesn't stop there. The Buddha said, there is a third noble truth. Uh, this one is important. Third noble truth. Under this third noble truth, the Buddha proclaimed, suffering need not be. Means, enlightenment in the here and the now is possible. Enlightenment in the here and the now is possible. So this one is very, very reassuring. Means, when there is wisdom, when there is understanding of the second noble truth, the cause of its arising, then suffering need not be. Then the cessation of suffering is possible. So this third noble truth is about cessation of suffering or enlightenment in the here and the now is possible. Then the fourth noble truth is the best. The Buddha didn't just stop there. He said, there is this fourth noble truth that relates to you or share with you the understanding of how suffering can end. So this one is the path, namely the noble info path. The path that leads to the end of all suffering. So this path basically is the Noble Eightfold Path. So the Buddha said, if you cultivate this Noble Eightfold Path, it will lead to the end of all suffering. So this Noble Eightfold Path is the understanding, or we call it the meditation as taught by the Buddha. But if you cultivate this, the Buddha said, it will lead to the end of all suffering. So, having gone through the Four Noble Truths, you will start to develop the understanding that the First and Second Noble Truth is still mundane, Dhamma. Then the Third and Fourth Noble Truth are the Supramundane, Dhamma. Yeah. Means beyond thought, beyond mind. That's why this Four Noble Truth is like the secret of life. When you understand them, you understand the secret of life. And this secret of life cover both mundane and supramundane. So having gone through the four noble truth with you all, then hopefully it can bring forth some very good basic understanding of the Buddha's teaching. So basically, yeah, if you look at the essence of the Buddha's teaching, why did I say it's the secret of life? Because from here, all of life, both supramundane and mundane, they are there, summarized clearly in just four noble truth. And I, I explained earlier on, these are called noble truth because when you realize them, it make you noble ones or enlightened ones. Even the first truth, noble truth, can also make you enlightened. Second noble truth also can bring about enlightenment in the here and now. Third noble truth also can. Fourth noble truth also can. But as a complete teaching, this fourth noble truth becomes the 
uh, what we call the essence of the Buddha's teaching. And from here, the four noble truths, all his other essential dharma or spiritual teaching, they actually spin off from here. That's why this is the beauty of the Buddha's teaching. Then as a Buddhist or Dhamma practitioner, we should thank the Buddha yeah, for giving us such wonderful teaching. Not only explain to you the secret of life, it enables you to develop the wisdom to understand life, then to awaken and become enlightened beings. Then when you become an enlightened being, you can live the life of an enlightened one. That's why there are three phases of Dhamma under his teaching. The first phase is Pariyati. Pariyati is the learning of his teaching. After you have learned the teaching, under phase two, the Buddha said, you have to develop the cultivation of it. So the cultivation of the teaching under phase two of Dhamma is called uh, Pati Pati. Eh? From Pariyati, you move on to Pati Pati. So after you have put this teaching into cultivation, then you will realize the enlightenment in the here and the now. Then you can realize the third phase of Dhamma, which is Pati Veda. You get to reap the fruit of your hard work to live the life of a noble one or an enlightened one. So these are the benefits that the cultivator of the way will develop. So hopefully, yeah, with this explanation, more and more Dharma practitioners or Kayamitas who are still yeah, going through uh, the understanding aspect of this uh, provisional teaching as taught by the Buddha to the Theravada tradition can be developed with much more faith and understanding. And when you have this base, then you can follow much clearer or much better later on when I go through the Heart Sutta. Because this four noble truths, at that time when I was sharing, I already shared before the Heart Sutta class. So that's why during the Heart Sutta class, this part of the sharing and teaching was not uh, included or recorded. But now, since I have the time, I'm going through it over a longer period, I can repeat this uh, and cultivate the way or the Dhamma practitioner can develop the understanding of it. Okay, we go back to the note now. So under part 2, we have covered uh, the first part, 2.1, the five mental hindrance I have gone through. Uh, then 2.2 is the opposite five spiritual faculty that can help you overcome the mental hindrance. So when your mental faculties are developed, especially this Sada, Virya, Sati, Samadhi, and Panya, once they are developed and they become very stable, they are called powers or balas, yeah, no longer normal spiritual faculty. Then after that, we have the third essential dharma, the five daily contemplation or what we call the five daily uh, dharma contemplation that leads to initial wisdom. This one, the Buddha advised the monks and the devotees to contemplate on them every day. Yeah. So now we go through. So as a cultivator of the way, we need to reflect and contemplate. But well, these five daily contemplation, they are very important for us to develop the initial wisdom. So let us go through it. Yeah? The Buddha said, this body of ours is of the nature to grow old, decay, or go through aging. Eh? For it has not gone beyond old age, aging, and decay. 
Then the second contemplation is to contemplate that this body of ours is of the nature to be diseased and to get sick. For it has not gone beyond disease and sickness. So this one you can also include injury. Uh, injury. Uh. Then the third reflection is this body of ours is of the nature to die because it is not an eternal entity. It's just a phenomenon or what we call not a permanent unchanging entity. That's why it's of the nature to die for it has not gone beyond death. So this first three, we can actually shorten it to become one. We can just include all these three. So normally under my contemplation in the early days, I do this. This body of ours is of the nature to grow old, get sick, and die. For it has not gone beyond old age, sickness, and death. So the reason being, this physical body of ours is made up of the four elements, the sana. And these four elements, there is no knowing, no life. So how can it be you? So these four elements, they come from nature. They go the way of nature. That's why it's of the nature to grow old, get sick, and die. And these are nature's phenomena based on nature's law, which are dependent on generating condition arising, causal phenomena. So because of that, the message given by the Buddha is not to attach and cling to this physical body. That is not really you. Yeah, this one is just elements, the four elements. The four elements of earth element, which is part of it, then water element, which is apple, then we have the heat element, which is tejo, then we have another one, which is wayo, or we call it the wind element. So the way the Buddha actually summarized the physical entity into four elements is to simplify the understanding. Because as modern science, scientific student, we know that there are a lot of elements uh, through chemistry. We have discovered a lot of elements. Uh, but we are not interested in going into such detail. We got no point. Basically, the four elements that the Buddha subdivide into cover all form of uh, physical forms, uh, or we call it the physical rupa. Uh, it's generally all elements has these four components. Uh, then after that, the fourth contemplation is also very important. This is the reality of separation. Uh, well, all this, if you slowly develop the understanding, you will trace back to the first noble truth reality that I mentioned just now. The first four is birth, old age, sickness, and death. So this contemplation, first three, cover old age, sickness, and death. So like the Buddha said, when you realize that this body is not a permanent unchanging entity, then you will not attach, cling, and grab onto it. Because it goes the way of nature. It's of the nature to grow old, get sick, and die like we contemplated. So do not be deceived. Do not be deluded. This initial wisdom is very really important. If it's not me, then why do I worry about you getting old, getting sick, and dying? But there is one more aspect of the teaching which people didn't really pay attention to. Even though this physical body of ours is not a permanent unchanging entity, doesn't belong to us, but it is related to us. 
karmically, where this physical body is karmically conditioned out for us to come to this existential world to perform the function of a human being or living being. So this physical body is a vehicle for us to come to this existential world to live life, to go through life, to experience karma and do whatever that we need to do while we are here. So understanding this is very important. Even though not real, impermanent, go the way of nature, lead to suffering, but when you have the wisdom, you can actually understand it's related to you. And then the other aspect is the fifth contemplation. The Buddha said, even though this physical body or so-called human being is not you, but he said, each and every one of us, we are all born of our karma, heir to our karma, conditioned and supported by our karma, and we are what we are because of our karma. So understanding this is very important. It may not be you, but it's related to you karmically. So this form and mind, or so-called human being, is actually subject to the law of karma. That's why you are born of your karma, heir to your karma, conditioned and supported by your karma, and you are what you are because of your karma. So your life, you look at this fifth daily contemplation, you will know almost 99.999% is all dependent on karma. If that is the case, what must we do? If we want to have the good life, we must take care of karma. Right? Because we are born of it, air to it, conditioned and supported by it, and we are what we are because of it. So this fifth daily contemplation will give us the initial wisdom to actually awaken. Means we have to follow the advice of the Buddha to avoid all evil, do good, to take care of our karma. Unless you follow the advice of the Buddha to avoid all evil, do good, you cannot take care of karma. Then after that, of course, the third advice is also very important. Cultivate wisdom or the meditative wisdom to realize the enlightenment in the here and the now so that you are not afflicted. Yeah. That's why the famous Dhammapada verse 183, which constitute the three beautiful advice of the Buddha are Sabha Papasa Akaranang, Kusalesa Upasampadan, Sachitta Pariyutapanang, Etang Buddhana Sasana. So under the Dhammapada verse 183, the Buddha mentioned very clearly, Sabbe is all, Papasa, evil, Akaranang, you have to avoid all evil. <coughs> that is to protect your good karma. Otherwise, you will lead to downfall. So how do we avoid all evil? That's why the Buddha came to realize without taking the five precepts, the minimum five precepts, you cannot avoid all evil. We are breaking these five precepts, constitute major evil. That's how the teaching of sila or morality come about. You must keep your precepts. That's why we chant just now at our pre puja. After we take refuge, we chant the five precepts. We renew our five precepts. Yeah. So taking refuge, chanting the salutations are very important. Yeah. So all this, they can actually lead to the initial wisdom to enable cultivator of the way to have deep penetrative understanding of the essential term. So the advice of the Buddha came from this right view with regards to a law of karma. When you know all living beings, not only human beings, they are all born of their karma, heir to their karma, conditioned, supported by their karma, and we are what we are because of our karma then we will take care of karma. We will not neglect karma. 
That's how the teaching come about. Okay? Then we move on to the fourth daily contemplation. This fourth daily contemplation is very important too. This is about separation. The reality of separation. The Buddha said, all that is dear to us can be our loved ones, our wealth, our prized possession, etc. Things that we hold on to dearly, like our reputation, our whatever, yeah, that we cling on to. They are all impermanent, and they are conditioned arising entity, dependent originating. Hence, they were separate from us one day, which means when conditions cease to be, it will cease to be. When condition is there, it will arise. That's why the Buddha always remind the monks and the devotees. He said, whatever that arises, there are causes and conditions behind. This implies our condition world, our dependent originating world, our existence world. That's why this world is a world of dependent originating, condition arising phenomena. Yeah. So, condition arising phenomena are always impermanent. They go the way of nature. When conditions cease to be, it cease to be. That's why separation is a reality. Then when we think we can own them, because he's still around. But what happens if your breath stops, your entity erased, which will occur during death? You cannot bring anything along. None will belong to you anymore. Maybe under the society's law, they call your estate. After you die, you only have the estate where the inheritor or the inheritance law will decide how and who inherit. Yeah. So either way, when conditions is to be, it means when there is no more condition, for all these things that you cling on to, hold on to, like your loved ones, your wealth, your possession, your property, your reputation, or whatever. If you think you own, even all the antiques, everything, your house. They were separate from you. Yeah. That separation can happen in many ways. Through calamity, through nature's disaster, or through economic crisis, or through there. So all these are the contemplation. So when you contemplate this, means you develop the initial wisdom to confront them. Where they are all dependent originating phenomena, condition arising, cause of phenomena, not a permanent unchanging entity, like your own physical body. They don't belong to you. That's why it goes the way of nature. That's why when nature's conditions separate, everything will separate. They have the dependent originating condition to arise. Then as long as the supporting condition are still there, it will sustain itself, like it exists. Then when the sustaining causes and conditions no more, it will cease to be. So, to develop the wisdom is to silence your mind to observe all this and witness the arising and passing away. To see clearly the law of dependent origination of Paticca Samopada. That's why without mindfulness, you cannot understand all this. You cannot see all this. So this five daily contemplation is to develop the initial wisdom to confront or to uh, develop understanding of the first noble truth reality so that you can break free from it. Okay, so we finish the first three, uh, what they call essential dhamma. Huh? Then we go on to 2.4. 
2.4 here is to make clear the meaning of craving, meditation, and attachment or clinging. So craving means your desire or your wanting. So when you crave means you want those things. So wanting things means sensual desire. Uh, your way. Then the other one is when you react, when you cannot get what you want, react to, is equivalent to craving leading to suffering. When things don't go your way, when you cannot get what you want, suffering will be the result. When your expectations in life are not met, suffering will be the result. Then meditation, there are three types of wisdom. First is through listening or hearing the Sutta. Nowadays, you can include reading. Reading can also be added. In the time of the Buddha, there is no writing, so no reading. Now, there is writing. Then the second type of meditation is the second turning wisdom. We call it contemplation, reflection, and inquiry. That one, under the teaching, they call it Chintamaya Panya. The first one, listening to the sutra or hearing the sutra or reading up the sutra is called Suttamaya Panya, wisdom born of listening or reading up the sutta, the discourse of the Buddha. Then the third type of wisdom is called Bhavana Maya Panya, wisdom born of Bhavana, means the direct seeing, sati, mindfulness, the meditative discipline, leading to awakening. So these are the three types of meditative understanding. Then the last one is attachment. So this attachment also can mean craving, can mean grasping, clinging, desire, etc. So once you have attachment or craving or grasping and clinging means you have delusion. Sakadity, self-delusion. You think you can own things. You believe you exist. You are real. All this will condition suffering. That's why craving is the cause of suffering. Okay, so we finish. Yeah? So at least we finish this page. Then next session, we will go to chapter 2. Yeah? Okay, we stop here. So now we can have our 45 minutes of meditation, eh? awareness-based meditation. So this awareness-based meditation, I explained, is very useful, very important. It trains you to develop the four, what they call awareness within. Eh? This awareness within is very important. Eh? That's why it's called awareness-based meditation. So there are four support yeah, to bring about this awareness within us. So like I explained before, the first support is just learn how to relax both body and mind. Completely relax and be at ease. When you relax, you don't think, no thought, nothing. Relax. Be at ease. Then don't try to know, don't try to do anything. Then the second support is just maintain awareness. Whatever happened, away, finish. Away, finish. Means don't try to know, don't try to do anything, just away. Like I explained just now, we have our six and dog. That's how we know the world. That's how we interact with the world. So whatever sense experience that arise has to come from this six and all. So maintain awareness to become aware at whatever arise within the six and all. Yeah. Where there is a 
perception or whether it's a sense experience just a wine don't allow it to carry through don't after perceive react and stir your mind and create more thinking and emotion don't if you do that you will become heedless lost in thought so the second support of being just aware is very important that's why relax maintain awareness then after that stabilize the awareness means let that awareness training continue until our awareness stabilize yeah. when you can do that you become beautiful then you will experience a transformation in you in your mind state all of the heedless thinking that you have developed while you are living life before you have the ability to be mindful in the midst of life all this sankara activity of thinking born of the mental hindrance and habitual tendency they will actually slow down slow down slow down and finally cease then you will experience a very beautiful state without thought who are you what are you realize that state the state of no thought no sankara activity nothing but there is a nature inside there the awareness nature there is just a way and that one is your true mind your silent mind your awareness pure awareness nature stay with that when you can stay with that you will progress you will develop good understanding of life you will come to understand clearly who are you what are you and how you function as a human being okay so maintain this training the fourth support is trust when you have the stability of mindfulness then you can do trust yeah. then for those who are familiar with your meditation object yeah, can be an anapanasati or rising falling or whatever it is you find that useful you can also make use of it yeah. what is important is to silence your mind and develop the mindfulness of the object of meditation that you are with like anapanasati just be mindful of the in and out breath until the mindfulness become very very stable then it will enter sati become very quiet and very still yeah. ultimately when it enters sati you will also realize your true mind your silent mind like the four support Either way, you can develop it. Okay. Now you can slowly, mindfully come out of the meditation. Try to maintain whatever inner peace, inner calmness, and inner awareness that you have developed for as long as you can. Okay. So now you are continuing our second session, which is. Meditation reporting, huh? followed by whatever question or answer that you may have. Huh? You can also share about dharma sharing in daily life, huh? or whatever that may be relevant or concerning today's topic. Huh? All this you can uh, discuss it. Ask question or share. Hi, good afternoon, Radio. Ah, Mrs. yeah, oh, yes, yes. Everyone, yeah. Uh, by sharing, I I think, uh, what I find very useful and important is, uh, you know, after a day of, uh, working very hard and busy, it, it will help very much if I just chill up, sit down and relax, uh, relax. Yes, sadhu. Yeah. Yes, very good. Yeah, and then can can feel everything uh cooling down. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. 
when you know how to relax and silent, then you realize your mind become peaceful and calm again. The sankara, everything, they will slow down. Then you will get back to your meditative state very fast. Uh, you should do that. Yeah. Then you realize you recuperate very fast. Uh, like you become peaceful, calm, tranquil, very fast. Uh, then next time you can do it in whatever situation or whatever place you are. You can just like fall back to your relaxed state of peacefulness. Uh, you just relax, maintain awareness. Then you settle down very fast. That's how you train your mind. Uh, most people don't know how to relax and maintain awareness. Sometimes when you are at the bank, uh, or you go somewhere where you have to wait, you actually can make use of your time uh, to relax. Then in the office, I remember I did uh, in the early days, like what you did. Normally after a period of doing things, eh, then whenever I got opportunity, I will just relax. Then I will meditate. But for me, because I have a room to myself, so normally when it's time for uh, whether lunch or whatever, then I will lock my door. Then I will meditate inside. Huh? Sometimes I also often like, huh? but if you don't have a room to yourself, then maybe you can't do that. But you can also relax and maintain awareness in wherever you are. Hmm. So it's all up to the individual. Yeah. So it helps you, huh? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Correct. That's uh, very good. Sometimes I realize. Uh, if I also do it uh, during my uh, working hours or when I interact with other people, uh, mm. like, you know, um, I feel overwhelmed or if I find something I hear or see not not, not very pleasant to my, <laughs> myself, ah. uh, then you if, can rest. Uh, you then, can just go back to that state and rest. Uh, uh -huh. well, yeah. Then you realize you settle down very fast. Uh. You will yeah. settle down very fast. Yeah. The, the negativity doesn't go to it. To yeah, the yeah. it doesn't go through the mundane mind to trigger off more thinking and emotion and stirring. You realize that process will enable you to stop all those movements. So you don't need to do anything. You just relax, maintain awareness, yeah. settle down. Mm. Yeah, Good. Yeah. Finally, you found a way to do it. Eh? Mm. Yeah. This oh, one you need to actually develop the meditative training until a while. Then only you can have the understanding. Then only you can do it. Uh, most people initially, when they learn how to meditate, they haven't developed the ability to stabilize their mind. They cannot do it. Eh? And most people got to revert back to the uh, either object of meditation or anapanasati or whatever object they feel that they can keep their mind calm or prevent the mind from wandering off. So that will enable you to settle down. Uh, so whatever skillful means that you have trained, you can use it. But the best is just relax, maintain awareness, uh, the three support. That one is the easiest. I realize that one settled down very fast. Uh, no need to do anything. In the midst of life also, same. You can settle down very fast. Uh. Yeah, true, right? Yeah. Mm. Before this, like, uh, cannot do, like, maybe because, like, you say the craving for still there. Yeah. Still want to uh, get involved. Yes, want definitely. to continue feeling uh, wanting it the, the way that I want it la. so that's ah, why right. can the thinking like... game continue inside there because the thought will try to find answer but the more you think the more problem it becomes yeah. then sometimes of course the thinking process can bring about a certain uh, relief or understanding 
provided you don't think the wrong thought and the negative thought. Uh, like what Sui went through and uh, he go and reflect it in another manner so that that thing do not actually continue to proliferate. Otherwise, it will continue to proliferate because most people will think of the negativity. Uh, why this guy like that? Why my boss like that? Uh, then whatever happened, you like blame yourself. Are ah, you why I'm so careless? Uh, uh, why I allow this thing to happen? So you realize the thought process, which is the one doing the analysis and the reasoning that try to get answer to settle down, that is the one that create more problem. Because without wisdom and understanding, the mind actually cannot settle down. But like the Buddha realized, finally, Sabe Sankara Anichang, yeah, it's important. Whatever you think, Sankara, whatever emotion you arise, they come and they go. It's impermanent. It will settle down. Then if you are not careful, you don't have Dhamma understanding and wisdom, it will bring about suffering. That's why the next one that the Buddha recites is Sabe Sankara Dukkha. So initially is to see the impermanence the empty nature of thinking. It doesn't bring about solution. It doesn't bring about uh, what they call uh, useful purposes. Then when you deludedly grab and cling, it creates more entanglement, suffering. Uh, and because of that, finally, when the cultivator of the way awaken, realize the truth, then they realize all of Sankara is like that, impermanent, leading to suffering. Then why think? Why reason? Why create? The most beautiful, tranquil state is the meditative state where there is no thinking. That's why you relax, maintain awareness. Then this mundane mind will slow down and return to its original state, which is the true mind, tranquil mind, without thinking. So that state, that pure state, that pure <laughs> awareness nature is what you need to develop as training so that you can stabilize it. Because once you are in that state, uh, the tranquil, silent mind is in the state of awareness or what we call sati, means mindfulness, then there is no thinking, no emotion. No views, no opinion, no habitual tendency to stir the mind. That's why all those Sankara activity, movement, they are the one that obscure our pure awareness nature and prevent us from being aware, prevent us from entering the meditative state of inner peace, inner calmness, and inner awareness. So now going back to what we shared uh, earlier on, the five spiritual faculties to overcome the mental hindrance, you check all five, they don't involve thinking. Like the faith, eh? Sada. The faith, once you have, it is a very calm and composed state. Then, here also, it will trigger of the zeal, spiritual zeal of tenacity to go this way. It's also not a thought. It's a driving force. And then of course sati is the meditative state. That's why when you are in sati, it's just like what you did. Relax, go back to the quiet state. Yeah. So that is the training of the mind to be aware. So once the sati is stabilized, it becomes smarty. And then everything will fall into place. Then you can see things as they are. You can insight into phenomena. You can awaken. Then wisdom keep on arising. Then whether it's the first turning, second turning, or third turning, the panya path, the last spiritual faculty, they will keep on arising. So once you understand this, the understanding will enable you to be in that state. That's why 
to maintain the ability to be aware, stabilizing it, to develop samadhi, then after that, constantly use it to develop the cultivation of the Noble Eightfold Path, means the meditative aspect, then it will transform into heedfulness. Means the mind that is ever mindful is also heedful. Heedful in the sense that it's ever mindful, constantly meditating, means constantly in that state of city or awareness, direct seeing, to live life, to observe, to insight into phenomena, to awaken, to understand what is going on. So this silent observation or the awareness based tranquil mind, which is the meditative mind, can actually develop a lot of understanding. That's why finally you will come to understand clearly who are we, what are we, and how we function as a human being and how through our senses we actually stir our mind, create all the movement, activity, sankara. Mm. So this observation is what we call sati, mindfulness. But you don't observe and command, no. uh, that you are gone already, you will deviate, deviate already. You don't go and reason, command, or kepo, uh, they say. Uh, go and stir your mind and add things and all those things. You just be a silent observer. Silent, uh, what they call... Uh, you, you just silently stay in that state of awareness. I would use that word. Because when you use the word observer, it's like somebody observing, then the thought will start to come out. Uh, so that silent awareness nature is not a being, always remember. That one cannot come out and live life. But that one create thinking very fast. That's why I always warn you all not to allow this movement to become habitual. Because that thinking is a habitual tendency. From the awareness nature is just come out. Unless you have stabilized that training to be aware, then you know that nature is that nature. And that nature is not a being, it cannot come in, but it's capable of being aware. Just like that. It's not the mundane mind. It's the creation from that nature that creates the mundane mind. So our purpose as a cultivator is to be in that state of awareness to observe, to see how it come out and create through the Sankara activity, through the emotion. And once you observe and see those clearly, then retrospectively, you will know how to reverse all those wrong thought, wrong view, and wrong understanding that condition all this movement. And that's how we straighten our view, free our mind, and enable us to function with wisdom. No more from that habitual tendency, no more from memory. Uh, so that way of living life is using the Dhamma wisdom. That's why Yoniso Manasikara, or what we call wisdom at the moment of sense experience. So all of cultivation, finally, when you develop it correctly, you will develop this understanding. It's from mindfulness, awareness, we develop the understanding. Without that silent mind to observe, we cannot. That's why the thought will trigger off the analysis, the reasoning. Not to say analysis and reasoning is of not much use or no use. It has its function and purpose. We are thinking is more for technological understanding, technical knowledge. But 
when you use the thought to try to understand a psychological problem, to develop a solution to a psychological problem, you can't. Your thought is limited. Thought is constrained by its egoic nature, the content of consciousness. Uh, so without the pure awareness, you cannot see the totality, the whole of it. Then you cannot actually understand sakayadity. So the egoic mind that actually trap itself in the thought process, you cannot see. When you cannot see, then you cannot understand what thought is. That's why Krishnamurti saw all this. That's why he can explain to you why he said thought is limited. Yeah. Thought is not whole. That thought divide and create all this duality movement. Yeah. So thought has its purpose in life. So you must put it in its proper place for mechanical thing for developing knowledge and understanding technology or those things, IT thing or thing. You can use thought. Thought is the best instrument for that. But when it comes to developing wisdom, psychological understanding to free the mind, you cannot use thought. The thought itself limits itself. To realize the awareness which is beyond thought, to realize the wisdom, to free it, you need the instrument that is beyond thought, beyond mind. And that instrument is awareness. Yet that is the one that creates the thought. It existed before thought. And that is the first thing to come out from our pure nature, our source, or our Buddha nature, or true nature. From there, the source, the first to come out is our pure awareness thing. And that one is with all living beings. Every living being, not only human being, they have that nature inside. So to realize that nature is to realize the primordial awareness nature before the arising of thought. And then you see how the creation come about how it actually created all this mundane mind and from the mundane mind how through the senses it projects itself, itself into the phenomenal world of consciousness. That is what we call life, existence and all those things. So that movement, if you can see it in the meditative silence, then you will understand the teaching. We are from that silent mind, all the teaching come to be. Okay, uh, Maya? Mm. Yeah, Varati Hot, <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. That was very useful, and uh, I understand why, you know, you always say that it's not easy to explain to other people. Correct, correct. It's very yeah, hard because to understand. that thing inside there. Huh? It, yeah. It's not a knowledge, you know, it's not a theory. You have to do it until you are in that state only. You can understand what I tell you. Otherwise, you cannot. You use your logical thinking and thought. You cannot understand. Because there is knowledge. And the accumulated knowledge don't have those things that you are supposed to realize. Means the complete awareness nature without thought. Once they are not there, they cannot understand what has been shared by me uh, or what the Buddha is trying to teach and explain. Uh. So sati, awareness, is very, very unique and very important. That's why that pure awareness nature within each and every one of us is very, very amazingly important. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, sadhu. Uh. Sadhu, sadhu. Uh, any question do you have, uh, Manya? Question. Uh. Question. Based have. on what we share today, is it clearer? Uh, 
uh, I came in. Especially the essential <laughs> dhamma, then uh. the four noble truth. Uh, I haven't gone into the three turnings yet. Uh. Yeah, it's great that Radio is uh, repeating the Hasutra. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, every time I go through the Hasutra, actually, for those who pay attention, they learn a lot. Hmm. Well, most people are not familiar with the teaching and how the essential Dharma are all connected and how through all the right views, all the other teaching come about. That's why the Noble Eightfold Path, the first power factor is Samaditi, right view or right understanding. So that three important spiritual law or spiritual right views are the basis of all the teaching. From the first one, the law of karma, karma niyama, just I explained already, the advice of the Buddha comes to be. Then the second right view is citta niyama, the paticca samapada, the dwelling, uh, that explain clearly how you function as a human being. Uh, then through that, you will come to understand how the mind actually manifests. Uh, how through the Paticca Samupada it create all this. Uh, so all the Sankara activity and movement can be understood through Chitta Niyama. That's why once you understand Chitta Niyama, you will penetrate the Dhamma and the Wisdom part. Uh, then of course, finally, is the third right view. The third right view is Dhamma Niyama. Means Right view with regards to all the essential Dhamma, the truth that the Buddha has taught us, uh, like the five mental hindrance, five spiritual faculty, uh, three evil roots of greed, hatred, and delusion, factors of enlightenment, and many other essential Dhamma. Uh, once all these are understood, then you like awaken. We have his whole teaching actually center on this three right view. Then with right view, you can arise the right thought, right speech, right action, and the right way to live your life. Then naturally, the four right effort can be understood. Where is through the four right effort, you develop the purification process. Initially, is to purify your views. That's why Diti Visuddhi then the content of consciousness, citta visuddhi. Yeah. So purification of view leading to purification of mind is very important. Means the thought process, the citta. Yeah. So all these are in the teaching. Yeah. You will be able to connect them all up. Yeah. That's why the essential Dhamma, you understand them, they are all connected, related. Like the blueprint eh, that Suyi has come up with, the chart. Eh. You call that the... My map. My map, uh, my map sorry. Uh, that one is very beautiful. That one link everything. All the teaching all come together. Uh, so mm -hmm. for those who don't know what the my map is, I think it's in the website. Uh, yeah? You can go and Google. But that one is very big, the map. You have to like slowly, slowly break it down. Uh, break it down. Uh, we try to print it out, but it's not <laughs> uh, not, not so... I use... How to use the word? Uh? The map is too big. Uh. We can cover the whole wall, right? Yeah. Ah, whole wall, so never mind. The word come out very small. Uh. It's small, and it's like you put on your whole floor, the whole house. Oh, you got to go all over to see. It. Not practical. The word is not practical. Even you print it out, not practical. Last time we tried, the LC help us from the office. We print it out based on what Sui has developed. So they print it out. But we still find that it's very big. That map is very big. But it's useful. If you have the Dhamma understanding and the interest, you will like it. Uh, I remember last time, Ng B went into it. He 
he even tried to translate into Mandarin. Uh, we managed to do it or not? Uh, under it's review. Under review. Uh, it's there. But, but no problem. Eh? Whoever wants to help translate into Mandarin, you can try. Then you send it to us. We will edit it. I will check with my wife. Yeah, her Mandarin is better. Then we will confirm it. Then we will do the necessary additional editing. Yeah, yeah my yeah. Very good. Doing, well, coming up with the mind map. Yeah. Actually, yeah, rather right the four novel truths and the three right views, it fits. Yeah. La. Uh, it, it fits. Before that, I was thinking, uh, don't know, like, I, <laughs> it was just words. La, and, uh, yeah. Knowledge, uh, knowledge. Uh. Correct, but correct. Now it's it, different. Huh? Uh. Yeah, it, it fits like, uh, I know why uh, the Buddha say that. Ah, so I, uh, now the right view has meaning. Uh, so, uh, yeah, not like meaning. last time. Last time only knowledge, you only rattle. Uh, yeah, yeah. Karma, niyama, chitta, niyama, dhamma, niyama. Uh, yeah, like law of karma. Ah, yeah, that ah, one's law of karma. Ah. Already, uh. <laughs> What's ah, new, right? Just that knowledge. Then yeah. don't know what that thing is. Then they cannot link to the fifth daily contemplation. Mm. Ah. Well, the yeah. fifth daily contemplation is the one that explains what that law of karma is all about. Ah. Yeah. Then later on, you need to go into it, what constitutes evil. Then elaborate on the three evil roots of greed, hatred, and delusion. And these are the essential dharma that are all there in the Theravada tradition's teaching. And when you have developed the understanding of that, then you realize they are all connected, connected to the first right view of uh, karma niyama, uh, the law of karma. And the precept also from there. Uh, that's why everything become like very clear. Uh, then all the right thought, right speech, right action, all also from there on. Even including right livelihood and the four right effort. Uh, then after that, we have the sati and samadhi. Uh, that one also spin off all the mindfulness and awareness teaching like the seven factors of enlightenment, the spiritual faculty, the four foundation of mindfulness. So all these are related to mindfulness. And then the contemplation type uh, of essential dharma also there. We have all the nosati, eh? Buddha nosati, Dhamma nosati, then Sangha no Sati, then Marana no Sati. Uh, all these are the contemplation, the second turning wisdom one. That's why you need to reflect on them, contemplate on them, inquire into them. And all the teaching, they are all related. Ability to understand will lead to the ability to connect them. Then when you can connect them, means your understanding has stabilized. Then like Manyuan Yosan say, now it like more meaningful already. All this teaching has its important meaning already. Not like last time, only knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. Just commit to memory, commit to memory. Then don't know what that thing is. And when you don't know what that thing is, you cannot understand the teaching, then you cannot apply. Understand? Not? But when you can understand the teaching, then you can apply. Then you realize that it is relevant to life. It can be cultivated. It can be realized. And it can be made use of while living life. And this is the real living Dhamma. The living Dhamma that can free the living being's mind. That can bring about transformation uh, for the better. Uh, very good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, rather dear like sometimes I um I see something want to comment. Uh, yeah. Then if I have the presence of mind then I I would you know think like oh 
if I say like that, a lot of karma, you know, you want to say that. Correct, correct. Sadhu, that is the, uh, what we call progress that will actually arise. Because you are more mindful already, more aware, and you understand what constitutes evil. Then that thing cannot come out or not. Your heart there, it will prompt you or not. Oh. Then you will know how to avoid that one one. Uh, then you will move on to cultivate the noble evil path one. Uh, then because you have cultivated the right view, you understand already. Then you have to develop the cultivation of the right thought via the third and fourth right effort. Uh, so during that phase, more and more of this virtuous thought, virtuous action and speech, they will surface from your uh, your understanding. Once the understanding is there, there's a cultivation of noble evil path involve another phase where you develop the contemplative wisdom after understanding the essential Dhamma and the basic Dhamma, what constitutes evil, then how to develop right thought leading to right speech, right action, and right life view. And that one you have to go in. Then you don't limit your right thought to only the four Brahma Vihara state of loving kindness, compassion, equanimity, and mudita or rejoicing. You will start to develop the understanding that everything that is virtuous is a wholesome thought, is a right thought. Like honesty, sincerity, gratitude, contentment, gentleness, pleasantness, all these are without evil root. Right? They are all right thought. That's why when you arise all this right thought, it will give rise to right speech and right action. Your thought precede action and speech. That's why all the appropriate right conducive speeches that brings about wholesomeness, harmony and understanding, you will know how to arise them. Then all of your action also, naturally you cannot do the evil thing, eh? like the precept one. You, because you see they constitute major evil. You cannot cheat, you cannot lie, you cannot deceive, you cannot even kill or cause harm. And that is a very natural consequence of understanding the Dhamma. Once you understand, you develop mindfulness, then this mindfulness will protect you from arising the wrong thought that trigger off the evil karmic process. Yeah. So all this, you realize they are all connected, linked. Yeah. So this is the phase where only cultivator can develop such understanding. So it's very really good, Manya. Yeah, uh, Sadhu. Yeah, right. Right. Mm -hmm. uh. correct. Before that, like, don't want to say something because, you know, you, you know, it, they say it's bad. But once you have the understanding, it's different, it, yeah. Different, uh, uh. You, you know why you don't want to say it. Correct. Uh, because, because the because understanding yeah. is behind. No more like last time. Last yeah. time, most people go by habitual tendency, you know. It's straight away come out, you know, understand, you know, those words. Oh, it's so habitual, it's like mechanical, it's just pop, 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 come out. But once you have the cultivation, the Dhamma understanding, uh, that you need so much sikara will prompt you, you know. This one will lead to negativity of karma. And then you straight away will not let it come out, really. That's why the second right effort to prevent the arising of the wrong thought can come about. Then later on, wrong speech can also come about. Wrong action can also come about because of the understanding. That's why I say without Yoni So Manasikara to prompt you, that old way of living life and doing things, that habit will come out. Your views, your opinion, all very strong. That one is like Asavak, you know. Like, like, like very strong inside you, you know. Keep on like coming out, you know. Like, like very latent. They call it latent tendency. You know. Very strong. Okay, one coming out. 
That's why in the early day when I cultivate, I saw all this. Then I realized when I was in the uni, uh, college day, I sing all those the college songs, uh, the dirty songs. Uh, until so happy, you know, and some of got the three criteria, Soma Nasa Sahagatang, uh, full of joy and happiness. Uh, then spontaneous, uh, no need to teach you. Uh, yes. And you do with joy. You know. That's why that one also become negative. You know. oh. Likewise, the three criteria for the highest merits, you do it with the three things. But you do it for negative things with the three things, it also considered the high. So that one I realized very difficult to rule out. It took me a while. You know. oh. Then every time I hear of the college song or what, uh, then that memory will trigger all. Uh, then that, 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 that uh movement of habitual tendency is there it like inside there start to sing right here. Oh. then i realized it took me quite a while to root that one out no? because all these are the conditioning the habitual tendency the belief system and we do it so often no? until it become a part of you no? and to reverse that uh, to straighten that view and root it out uh, Took me quite a while. I remember uh, after 1989 only, uh, I can really root it out. Well, before that, uh, no way. Uh, like I told you all, uh, last time I like to play mahjong with my classmate and all those things, uh, even like badminton or what. You play until like it's part of your life, you know, you really love that sports, you really love that game, and it's like a passion, you no. Know? But then, after 1989, a uh, very funny one, uh, you can ask my wife, I just stopped playing Mahjong. Uh, then I also can hang out my racket. Uh, uh, of course, sometimes I still take it out and just uh, check my stroke and swing and exercise a bit. That one, I, once in a while, I still do. But those things happen to me. After 1989, when I developed the understanding, I just stopped. You cannot say, I don't want to play mahjong with my classmate. I don't want to play badminton. How can I just stop like that? And I myself, inside my heart also, I felt strange. You know? How come like that one? Suddenly, I just stopped. I don't need to do all those things. You know? It is nothing to do with guilt or what, no, that this is wrong here. Nothing to do with that one. That form and mind that has the understanding suddenly like see no meaning in doing all those things like me. Then whether I do or I don't do, no difference. Especially the Mahjong thing, because well, sometimes I want to test, I want to find out how come like that. So I thought I lost interest, me, I lost the skill. But when I was in back in Alostar where I sometimes they my brother sister they all still play. Then I will go to the Mahjong table there. I will still go ulu the card. I realize the skill are all still there. I can still know the card and all the thing. But the interest is no more, not like last time. Right? Last time you can really go into it like it's your passion no. You like it so much. No? Anytime people call, that time I will just go unless my wife or whatever, there are other things that I won't. Otherwise, I will try to go. But later on, after that year, stop completely. That's why wisdom is very different. Right? It will transform you and it will really change you completely. You become like completely different. So once you go through the cultivation, you yourself transform, you will know one. And people can see it on. People who are close to you, they realize you are different. So very good. Uh, Manya, you brought up a good condition today yeah, to share all this. Yeah. I can understand what Radio is trying to say. Ah, you can understand already. That's why the cultivator will understand what I share on. Uh. And uh, Radio, the other thing is that mm. once Radio say uh, uh, one of the, I don't know what the word, good thing is, you know, uh, having uh, uh, not a lot of duties. Uh, ah, that is a blessing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh. So, really, I thought 
why I want to uh, do so Retire. many things. <laughs> I don't know. And maybe I, I will still at 55. La. I, I think I can still manage. But, yeah, no problem. Um, because you can continue to work. Continue uh, to work. Don't have to retire so early. Because while you are working, you can still cultivate. In fact, the best phase is while you are working. That's why that time, I remember, before 1989, uh, that time I was at the peak of my career. No? I, I love my career so much. No? Then when I go through that career path, then I develop the cultivation. Then I realize uh, I can have a family. I can be even working as a career personnel or civil engineer and I can develop the cultivation simultaneously you know, no problem at all then after 89 I remember I became so different I want to come out and test myself you know, uh, to find out what actually makes me different after this understanding of then the condition arises you know. then I came up and I tested myself, I joined the private sector. Then I told you how I saw my mind transform. Uh, then how from there onward, when the actual collapse of the Monday mind happened, then another phase surfaced. Uh, then I continue to transform and become different again. Then I see life differently. Uh, that's why after 89, uh, I continued to work for another 11 years now. I retired in the year 2001, Labor Day, I remember. Uh, so another oh, 12 years, uh, 89, 12 years. I worked for another 12 years uh, before I really retire. Uh, because the condition arise. Uh, then that time, I say, and now, <laughs> because after that, actually, I haven't come out to share yet, 2001. I only come out to share three years later, 2004, when Yun Chan uh, came to me. Uh, so, how long you want to work, Man Yuan, depend on your understanding. One. You can continue, no harm. Uh, but a few duty one is correct. That one is useful. Uh, when you work, you must work smart, as I know. Means yeah. work with wisdom and under you don't go and like uh when they dump to you a lot of work uh, you don't go and take everything out. Uh, you you have to be aware, mindful that you already so senior and so no. You have to delegate your work, you delegate. Then whatever that is given to you you just do it as an understanding that this is work within office hour. Yeah, you are not interested in further promotion and all things. No point, yeah, so. And just tell them, for you, you need to actually take this easy. Yeah, as you reach the age beyond 50, I think your boss also will not give you more duty. Unless you are the one that aim high and want to be promoted and all those things. Otherwise, I think they will understand you. Uh. Then you just like stay in that job. Uh. For me, when I was in the private sector, that 11 years I told you, actually I experienced a lot of new things which I never go through before. Uh. But I know how to handle them really. That's why no more problem. So the 11 years was actually like honeymoon year to me. I was paid good salary and I got to actually uh, uh, go through that phase with a lot of joy and understanding. That's why I understand the third phase of Dhamma, Pati Veda, very well after that. Uh, then when three years later, 2004, when Yun Chan came, uh, then only my Dharma sharing and teaching start. Uh, then that one took me on another phase again. Uh, so that's how all this become possible. Okay, I think we have to end already. Yeah? I heard the alarm. Uh, 
Yeah. So anyway, we rejoice with Manya's good condition and sharing that brings about all this understanding. Yeah? Let us rejoice. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. Okay, now we will do the sharing of merits, transfer of merit, then we will end the whole Zoom session. Aka Sata Chirobhumata Deva Naga Mahindika Punyang Tang Anamoditwa Chirang Rakan Tulokasa Sana Itta Wata Chamehi Sampadan Punya Sampadan Sabe Deva Anamodantu Sabe Sampati Siddhiya Idang menya tinang ho tu sugita hontu nya teyo. Idang menya tinang ho tu sugita hontu nya teyo. Idang menya tinang ho tu sugita hontu nya teyo. Devo asatu kalena sa sesampati hetu cya. Vito bawa tu loko cha, Raja bawa tu dhammiko. Itmena punyang kamena, Mame bala samagamo, Satang samagamo hotu, Yawa nivana patiya. Sadhu, sadhu, Sadhu. Okay, you all can now pay respect mindfully to Lord Buddha, Konyin Bodhisattva, and all the worthy ones. Then we end. Eh? Sadhu.